Welcome to session three of the 2020 Global Marathon. My name is Mimi Irvin, and I'm the chair and host of this year's Global Marathon. Today, we're going to talk about breaking old rules and building new dynamics to make your career work for you. This year's marathon is all about building and supporting the factors that help women persevere in engineering and tech. Many women who persist in the field say they're motivated by a strong desire to contribute to society. But how do we make sure women have the opportunities and outlets for harnessing that power? Our rule-breaking speakers will give us their best tips and strategies. Joining us from London, Pavlina Akratas, is an associate lighting designer specializing in designing daylight and electric lighting systems in museums and gallery spaces. She was named one of the top 50 women in engineering under 35 in 2017 as one of the 40 under 40 young lighting designers globally in 2018 and as one of the 100 most influential women leaders in engineering in the UK and in Europe in 2019. Let's get started. So just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I was born in this tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea called Cyprus. And while Cyprus is very well known for its blue skies and its blue seas, I spent most of my time in the, my younger years studying and playing tennis. I followed the English curriculum system and I did my GCSEs. My favorite subject in school was mathematics but I wasn't particularly strong in science. I didn't really like physics that much. But when I had to choose my A-levels, I was influenced by my father who had his own company called Acritas Consulting Engineer. My, brother, my father had a very big influence about what I was going to do from my very early on. And he suggested I take physics for my A-levels. And this is what I did. And I was really proud to get an A, in particular when I did very limited amount of it in my earlier years and on a subject that I didn't particularly like. I was still very, very strong in mathematics, and I really liked design, even though I wasn't as good, I guess, as in mathematics and physics. So what I'm trying to say here, you do not need to have everything figured out. You can always change, you can always experiment until you find something you really liked. So I moved from Cyprus to the US, and I went to the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign, where I studied electrical engineering and I played uh, tennis for my university. So it was quite fashionable at that time to do a master's degree. And while I like my technical background, I really wanted to do something a little bit more designing. So I, I left the US and went to London where I did my master's in light and lighting at the University College London. Since so engineering is not just science, it is also art. Since graduating, I've joined Arab and I have been playing with light ever since. So just a little bit about my work now. Um, so what I particularly like about what I do is that I get the opportunity to work on projects from all over the world. Through my career, I worked in Europe, I worked in the US, I worked in Mexico, I worked in South Africa, in Hong Kong. And this is what I particularly like because you get an opportunity to work with different cultures, with different kinds of people. Uh, so it's really amazing. But things didn't start off like this. So when I first started as a graduate engineer, I spent most of my time doing things like this, working on very, very big models that would take two to three hours to open, doing a bunch of dots in order to analyze daylight availability, doing more and more models, more dots, more big humongous models with rays, building courtyards, so building these areas in order to analyze daylighting. I even remember I went to my boss and told her, you know what, I don't really like, I studied electrical engineering, I wanted to do something a little bit more exciting and something a little bit more creative. But things are not always like this. So the first big project that I worked on was the London Aquatic Center. And I started working on this around 2008 uh, and it was completed in 2012 for the London Olympics. So it's quite a long process and this process can go thrown through different uh, stages. So she start off with sketches, looking at different design options, doing a lot of calculations, analyzing your work, 
doing a lot more calculations, looking at different options, doing a whole bunch of drawings, doing a lot of uh, snackly, so you go visit the site, analyze it, do a lot of mock-ups in order to actually come up with the final design uh, for its opening in 2012. So it takes a lot of time. So be patient. It takes time to build a building. So be passionate. Look after the building. Go the extra mile. Look at the details. Uh, look at the details. Deliver high quality buildings. Now the project I'm most proud of is the Gagosian Gallery at Gross Vernon Hill. And the reason for that is because it gave me an opportunity to some, do something very, very innovative, something that hasn't been done before. So here the client wanted the gallery to be uh, lit through a series of uh, backlit panels. And the idea was to replicate daylight in real time. So in order to do that, I had to do a lot of research, understand how daylight changes both in levels and color. In terms of light levels, there is a lot of research. There is, um, there is um, weather stations all around the world that take real measurements of the light levels of daylight through different times and through different seasons. But in terms of color, there is not a lot of research. So this is my research, uh, my, me looking through the internet, trying to understand how the color of light changes. And because there wasn't a lot of information, I started doing my own research. So this is uh, just some photographs that I took. Um, so I took hourly measurements, both in color and color temperature in order to understand how the color of light changes. And based on that, I developed a program that uh, where there is a sensor outside the building, it takes the color uh, and light levels uh, of the exterior conditions and based on the measurements, the interior lighting uh, changes dynamically in order to replicate what is outside. I still remember the day we went to commission the project. Uh, the project was running behind schedule. There was a whole bunch of journalists uh, inside the space. Uh, you can see there is some windows. Um, and it was a partly cloudy day. And I remember the control manufacturers flipping on the switch and then the interior changing dynamically in sequence with the exterior. And it was so amazing because you could see where there was a cloud uh, covering the sun. You could see everything inside going very, very dim, very, very blue. But when the cloud left, this, uh, the, everything will become very, very bright and very, very warm. So it was really amazing to see it. Something that you're really, really, not really sure if it will work because it was quite an unusual project, but then working so well. And it was so fulfilling for me to see come to, come to life. And this instigated a circadian lighting trial that we've done within Arab. Uh, the idea was to understand what, how can we improve the health and well-being of people that work in spaces with limited or no daylight. So what we've done, we this is our uh, office space. We've covered uh, windows with uh, a whole bunch of uh, blinds. So we've covered them, so it was completely blacked out. And we used uh, LED fixtures with full spectrum and we've played with se different sequences uh, and different colors in order to understand what we as uh, engineers can do in order to make our spaces uh, more lively and more exciting and better for people to work in. So be curious, deliver quality work that exceeds clients' expectations. Um, so after the Gagosian project, uh, an architect uh, approached me and asked me if I wanted to work on fashion shows for Paris Fashion Week. And this is something that you never expect to happen. I mean, when you're small, you think, you know, you do engineering, you do uh, some amazing buildings, but never something like this. So it was quite amazing for me to be involved uh, in the, uh, these fashion shows because uh, they, uh, they're quite exciting, they're unusual, uh, and it's great to um, be working on these sort of things. So passion and quality builds your reputation. So if I have to think now, what is, is this really what an, engineering, an engineer is? Well, sure, I spend time in hard hats, but this is not how I spend most of my time. I spend most of my time meeting people from different cultures, uh, doing a lot of mock-ups, having a lot of fun with light, meeting different artists, architects. So I don't really work, uh, wear a hard hat that much. And this is what also got me involved in this is engineering campaign uh, by the Royal Academy of Engineering. The idea is to change the perception of what engineering is and, ex and make people, younger people excited about taking a career in engineering. 
And this is also a recent article that went on the BBC News and it's all about changing the perception of engineers. It's not about hard cuts. You can pretty much wear whatever you want. You can wear high heels, you can wear flip flops, you can wear shorts. It's all about delivering high quality works. It's all about breaking the rules. Thank you. Vanessa Raponi is a product development EIT at Spinmaster, an international toy company founded in Toronto, where she brings complex toy design ideas to life. Vanessa is a passionate advocate for intersectional diversity in STEM and has most notably founded the national nonprofit organization Ingequeers Canada, which serves 30 university LGBTQ engineering organizations and is run by students from coast to coast. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vanessa Raponi and I am a product development EIT at Spin Master and I'm also the founder of Engequeers Canada. So I'm so excited to be here today to record this and talk to you all um, about my life story and I'm hoping to take an approach of kind of talking about my professional journey as well as my personal one and the timeline is going to be a bit all over the place so I encourage you to bear with me but hopefully it will all make sense. So I kind of want to start around the current state of where I'm at in life. So I am the founder of Engequeers Canada. Uh, what that is, is an LGBTQ engineering organization, um, which is a incorporated not-for-profit that touches all of Canada. So what started as um, me when I was 19 years old, uh, just being interested in finding other queer people to connect with at McMaster University, um, it just started as the McMaster Engequeers and actually expanded all the way to Engequeers Canada, this national uh, body with 30 schools in nine provinces. And that was a several year journey. And what our pillars of are for Engequeers are about education and advocacy, uh, social connection, and about professional development. So all of the member groups and universities that participate in Engequeers focus on those main three initiatives. And in founding EQ, I've had the incredible privilege and honor to talk about diversity and inclusion in so many different spaces uh, and different audiences, whether it was at the National Council of Deans meeting with all engineering deans across the country in Prince Edward Island, or whether it was uh, NSERC, which is the national government research body, um, their gender summit, which was an international event in Montreal, getting to give a keynote to 500 people in the room. I've had some incredible experiences in promoting diversity and inclusion in the STEM space in my career. As well as a big part of Engequeers is giving content related diversity trainings. So I've done a lot of um, talking about intersectionality, explaining different systems of oppression and how racism and classism and sexism and heterosexism all work together to create uh, challenges and barriers for people like me and other minorities. So EQ is, of course, something I'm extremely passionate about and has been a really big part of my life for a, the majority of my undergraduate degree. Uh, but I graduated a couple years ago in uh, May 2018. So now I act more in an advisory capacity to the team. And I it's, it's now entirely run by uh, undergraduate and graduate students across the country, literally from coast to coast. So I get to just kind of support it now, which is great. In terms of my actual uh, job and career, I am currently a product development engineer at Spin Master. So you might be wondering, what is this really cool room I'm in? Uh, I'm in a room called the Toy Box right now. So Spin Master is a Canadian founded international toy manufacturing and entertainment company. Uh, and I work on the product development team in engineering. So essentially I got in, I got into Spin Master doing their engineering management development program, uh, which was about three six month rotations in different operations field functions. So I worked in product development engineering, I worked in uh, supply planning or supply chain, and I worked in indirect sourcing. So this gave me like a really holistic view of how Spin Master's operations and manufacturing works. And I mean, we literally make toys. So I get the opportunity, whether it's to 
race cars and test their speed and take them apart or whether it's uh, flying ferries and making sure that their uh, weight is evenly distributed and their center of gravity is working out. Um, these are big parts of my job. And it's also a very collaborative leadership-based job. So I do a lot of project management. I do a lot of cross-functional leadership and teamwork with multiple teams, whether it's trying to help the brand team in their marketing message or the design team um, turn their ideas into real toys. It's been just an incredible experience. So those are kind of about where I'm at now with EQ and with Spin Master, which is all really, really great and really exciting stuff. Um, but I really do want to talk about the journey that got me here because sometimes I find it can be... Um, you know, whether intimidating is the right word or overwhelming to kind of hear all this information. Um, and I hate whenever people kind of like put me on the pedestal of like, oh, I did all this stuff in the past or I um, had these experiences and I have this great job. Like these are all, um, you know, true in certain extents, but I want to focus um, a bit on like what I've kind of been through to get here. So I want to talk a little bit about the hard stuff first, just to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, so my experience growing up was complex. So I'm a queer woman of color. Uh, my mom is an immigrant from Sri Lanka, and my father was uh, in, his, the rest of his family was born in Italy, and he was the first one born in Toronto. So very, you know, fresh into Canada, that family, the, that side of my family as well. And growing up, we just didn't have um, significant financial means by any by any sense of the definition. So uh, we lived in a very well-off area. Uh, however, we were in the apartment above the store. So I kind of grew up in this way where I was struggling to fit in. I was one of the only people of color in my school. Um, I, there was a very significant um, wealth imbalance between me and my peers, and it definitely weighed on me a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I was also dealing with some other things going on with both my father and my stepfather at the time. So I, I don't want to get too much into the details because I don't want this to be too heavy or too intense, but I will say that um, my father did struggle with homelessness for m a large portion of his life related to his mental health and his addictions. And I experienced a lot of, and witnessed a lot of, you know, um, abuse related things, domestic violence and um, things targeted at me personally, which resulted in me kind of cutting off ties with my father at the age of 15. And then on my stepfather's side, I uh, we ended up in a court case battle where he pleaded guilty towards um, child sexual abuse. So I have been through a lot in terms of my upbringing and my family, but I also had a lot of great things that happened in and around that time in, in, uh, in growing up. Specifically, my mom and my sister have been my rocks and my role models from the day I was born. They're both very, very driven career women. My mom is a social worker and she literally sits there every day helping people and at their darkest, most challenging times and has really instilled a sense of the importance of volunteering, the importance of giving back into me and my sister. And then my sister is uh, this rockin' career, business-focused woman um, who's actually been living in England for the last decade. And she's now on the executive of her company that was just a small startup uh, when she started a decade ago. So both of these women have been incredible personal role models to me and have helped me r just really believe that there is no limit for women and that anyone can do anything related to their career. So I also think that for me, um, I had a lot of inspiration through different means, like the first time I learned about Mary Curie in like grade 10 or 11 chemistry class, just hearing about this woman who had won a Nobel Peace Prize and had all these scientific discoveries. Because in those classes, you typically only hear about men that discovered things at different points. Um, but I found just, you know, having any kind of role model or visibility of people who've done amazing, successful things in their past really did go a long way for me. 
And even as ridiculous as it is, Harry Potter, like Hermione Granger taught me about the importance of being super dedicated in school and um, like how you can lead and be in a team of men. And they all know that, you know, you're the one who's going to have the answers and that's totally fine in that kind of dynamic. And uh, so I, I actually have like a Harry Potter tattoo because it reminds me of um, that thing that's really important to me and uh, where I learned a bunch of morals and, and got really excited about being an ambitious person and doing a lot of things. So, so yeah, for, for me, the journey to enter engineering, I, you know, as I kind of mentioned, I was going through a lot growing up and I didn't really have anyone in my direct life who was really explaining to me what engineering was or what I could do. And I ended up um, just, it was one colleague of mine or peer of mine um, who we were in the same swimming lessons, who he was telling me about how he started chemical engineering. And then a friend's dad who was actually working in engineering in Bombardier. Um, they both kind of explained to me what engineering was and uh, kind of, you know, I, I just knew at the time I really liked chemistry and I liked calculus. Those were my two favorite classes in school. And I knew that because of my kind of financial upbringing, I wanted a career that would be financially stable. That was like a really important thing for me was to be able to support myself so that I could, you know, navigate this world that we live in um, really independently. And and they kind of encouraged me to go into engineering. I got into McMaster University, had a wonderful experience at, in my undergrad. Um, and I did a lot of co-ops and I did an exchange. So what that meant was right out of first year, um, I worked at Bombardier Aerospace. I had the opportunity to work at their like four or 5,000 person facility at Downsview, um, working as a maintenance engineering intern and getting to spend a lot of time in their materials department. So for my second co-op, I did um, an internship in France. I went to the Grenoble Institute of Technology for eight months, where I did four months of actually doing research in the lab of their materials department and four months of school for the September to December time. And uh, I got to just experience what it was like to work in an international team. I was literally sitting with someone from China, someone from Brazil, someone from France and myself. And that was my like office space. And we were doing very technical research and I got to kind of explore the world of academia. Then I started working at PepsiCo. So I did four months working at the Quaker plant in uh, Peterborough, which was again, a manufacturing facility where I literally got to see like oats being produced or, or sorry, oatmeal being produced, um, like cereal, chewy bars. And I got to work as more of an engineering project manager. And that also led me out to Vancouver where I did eight months of working on their beverages side of Pepsi. So eight months at Pepsi beverage Beverages. Um, again, on the manufacturing floor, seeing this time the extremely automated process of how the cans and bottles and Gatorade and um, bag and box, which is like soda machines, how all those are manufactured and getting to work in that environment, doing a lot of um, Lean Six Sigma manufacturing work and uh, learning a lot about that whole world. And, and that's really where I fell in love with manufacturing and decided um, that I wanted to use my materials engineering kind of background um, in the specific context of applying it to industrial applications. And I wasn't as passionate about um, like steel processing or iron making or nickel making. And I instead was more interested in making things for like consumer packaged goods. And that's where I found Spin Master. So I uh, was interested, I've lived in Toronto my whole life. I was interested in staying at home um, for, uh, you know, kind of my early young life of graduating university and, you know, the foreseeable future. And uh, yeah, this job is amazing and crazy and <laughs> very, um, very rewarding. I've had some incredible opportunities here through the management development program to really uh, develop myself as an individual. And now on the product development team, um, just yesterday, I got the news that I'm now going to be backfilling for some of our New York product development engineers, which is going to send me to New York a little bit. Uh, so just like an incredible opportunity to apply engineering in a unique way. 
And uh, yeah, so so kind of the, the three messages I really wanted to leave the audience with. The first one is about resilience and persistence. So uh, resilience in the spectrum of, I kind of alluded to some difficult times I had in life and they really weighed on my mental health. And there were multiple times where I was actually even suicidal and didn't really see an end to some of the, the pain and the darkness I was going through at the various times. But today when I experience joy, whether it be big or small, I'm just so grateful that I get to be on that other side and experience those things. So really um, persevering through dark times, but also even within the scope of NG Queers, like if I hadn't kept going with EQ and just kept emailing, kept calling, kept going to different conferences, finding the right people to help and leveraging other people um, so that I wasn't doing everything on my own, uh, it wouldn't be what it is today. So whether it's any kind of goal you have, if you just keep your resilience and persistence up, like that is going to do wonders for your career. Um, the second one is about kind of truth and honesty. So being truthful and telling the honest facts can sometimes be really challenging and can weigh on you. However, you can sometimes really motivate others by just being honest and being candid about what you're experiencing, being true to yourself, being authentic. Um, like for instance, I have a rainbow tattoo, which helps, you know, whenever someone sees it kind of end up having a conversation about how I'm queer. And like, I love whenever that happens. Um, and the last one is about obligation to society. So I kind of mentioned how my mom has, uh, this has been a social worker my whole life, just knowing that there's people are going to be going through things all around you um, and you might not always know it. So just having that sense of uh, volunteering and the passion to give back and care about others is just, again, whether it's helping you in your career or just helping you go through life, it's just a really important thing to not forget about those less fortunate than you and to do what you can to make the path easier for those who are walking through your footsteps. I think that it's really important for everyone to really push boundaries and try to break the rules wherever you can. So for me, with my journey with creating EQ Canada, um, like talking about queer issues and having people be openly queer just was not a thing as far as recently as 2013. It's hard to believe, but I could count on one hand the number of openly queer people at McMaster at that time. And now I've had literally dozens of people come out to me as bi or gay or trans. We've I've, I've seen people transition genders and like since EQ has started. So um, never underestimate the power of just, you know, going against the status quo. Whether you're someone like me or someone with a, a different story, if you've been through um, any kind of challenge and struggle, whether it be at an early age or, or today, um, I think it really does give you a an extra toolkit of handling stress and handling when things go wrong. Because I know that in, even in the last couple of years, whenever something has been like really bad, I'm like, it's so minimal compared to how bad it has been in my life in the past that it really helps me kind of brush things off and keep going forward and roll with the punches. Um, and I think that, you know, for many women in engineering and STEM fields that they have been through various things that have given them the resilience to keep going. Um, and I do think that that, you know, the, this, uh, article and paper that has been referenced in this whole global marathon, I think really res could resonate with a lot of people that yes, having been through challenging things does give you um, the ability to, to move forward in and, and overcome barriers in, uh, in STEM. If you're like me where you didn't know anything about engineering, or if you're just someone who just isn't sure where you want to end up, leveraging co-ops and internships where you get a taste of really working in various environments and really immersing yourself and getting to know people to understand what a day in the life really is like of different jobs has been incredibly invaluable in my career. Like I did not know what a materials engineer actually did until I worked at Bombardier and saw a failure analyst working with million dollar microscopes every day. Or I didn't really know what academia meant until my week long assignment was find something interesting. So like I, <laughs> I learned so much about these completely different fields through my co-ops and I strongly recommend uh, anyone in STEM to really get out there in industry um, 
when you're young and when you can be really flexible and travel and do all that early on, because then it'll help you get the job that you really, really want that will bring you fulfillment and joy on the actual day to day basis. So uh, thank you so much. It's been a great opportunity to do this and I look forward to the Q&A. Laura Aiken is a workforce planning coordinator on the Pennsylvania Chemicals Project with Bechtel. She worked across design engineering, construction, and gas and petrochemical projects in the UK, US, and Australia. Laura is also the Global Vice President of Women at Bechtel and assumed the role of the Global Chair in July 2018. My name is Laura Aiken. I'm a chartered and professional chemical engineer. I've lived and worked in four different countries as an engineer, and currently I'm a turnover manager for Bechtel Corporation. I want to start with a story. A few weeks ago, I was at a networking event, and one of my team was talking to a local business owner. She asked uh, for a card that she could give to her boss, gesturing to me and a man I was talking to. The local business owner then said, oh, I know him. He lives down the road from me. This uh, assumption is something that women and minorities have to deal with in the engineering and construction industry a lot. Um, for the vast majority of us, we assume and we're conditioned, conditioned to assume that the white male is the boss. And for women and minorities in the industry, we have to overcome that assumption before we really do anything else. And actually, the local business owner was a woman too, who assumed that she wasn't. This assumption ties into the leadership archetype that is prevalent in the corporate world. Does any of this sound familiar? The leader is strong, eloquent, charismatic. The leader is able to take a hard line and be assertive. The leader stays late, comes in early, takes their laptop home on weekends because they're dedicated. None of these characteristics are really um, tied to one type of person, but they are common and accepted and often expected in men in the workplace. This is why tall men have a greater chance of being a leader and why there are almost as many men named John in the American C-suite than there are women. I want to open the door to a new leadership archetype, one that celebrates all the different types of leaders that we can be, rather than try and fit a decades old square peg into a round hole. This benefits everyone. As an industry, if we can't celebrate the diversity of people and include diverse people, then we are not gonna be able to attract and retain and develop the vast talent that there is out there. What I wanna speak about today is a new type of leader, a leader who values delivery, but also values inclusion and values wellness. What I'm also gonna talk about is my diverse experience in engineering for some of our younger viewers and demonstrate that a degree in engineering can take you literally all over the world. A little bit about me. I've never really defined myself as a rule breaker. I listen to authority figures, I cross roads at the designated crossing area, I stand on the right side of the escalator. But in preparing for this talk, I guess I do have a bit of an unconventional career path. I was born and raised in the Middle East, uh, and I had the very privileged and happy upbringing of an expat brat. I did good at school. I enjoyed art and singing, but I also gravitated towards a lot of the things that were typically for the boys. I guess I didn't buy that. I did karate, football, the British version of football, basketball, sciences, maths. And at age 18, I moved around the world to study chemical engineering at the University of Bath. In 2011, I started my career with Bechtel in London. Bechtel is an engineering, procurement, and construction contractor, which means we design, buy, and build mega projects all around the world. In London, I was a project engineer, which meant I was in design engineering, doing hydraulic calculations and working with a lot of different engineering groups to create a system design and consolidate our piping and instrumentation diagrams. Lots of fun. 
From day one, I wanted to work abroad and particularly work at site. That opportunity didn't come from me until September 2013 when I got a phone call. Houston needed some engineers to support a project. That was Thursday and I flew on Tuesday. That assignment that was meant to last eight months, well, I guess it hasn't really ended yet. I went from supporting that project to join our liquefied natural gas technology department where I was writing technology instructions and design guides to incorporate best practices for use company-wide. Still, I wanted to go to site. And over the course of a year, m there were people around me who were tapped to go, but I wasn't. It wasn't until meeting with one of the LNG technology managers that I realized what was going on. And it's not what you think. This LNG technology manager was a great mentor to me, he was a technical guru, and I was working very closely with him pretty much to extract everything from his brain and put it down on paper. One day, this meeting, he happened to ask me what my career goals were, and I said that I wanted to go to site. Do you know what he said? I had no idea. That week, I was on a list to support the next plant uh, performance test, and a few months later, I was on a plane to Australia. So my first piece of unsolicited advice is don't assume, especially don't assume that people know your career goals. And in fact, the reason that I got to Houston in the first place was because I was vocal about travel, so I should have known better. I spent six months in Australia on two different projects. The first, I was executing a plant performance test with a team where my roles varied between uh, supporting commissioning and startup and getting systems over the line or doing compressor load calculations. On the second project, I became a commissioning and startup engineer where I was driving system completion to hand over to our customer. In Australia, it was tough being away from my partner who was in Houston, but the work was challenging, the community was really close and the beaches were amazing. After I got back to Houston, my partner Matt and my cat John, I spent some time with our corporate engineering group. That was a really fun job. I had a couple of different roles that were a really new experience for me as an engineer. Uh, I got to craft an automation tool and lead a software development team uh, to develop an automation solution for engineering. I got to work on a project to improve learning and development across engineering. And I even, excitingly for me, got to drive some best practices in diversity and inclusion across a population of almost 4,000 engineers. It goes to show you that there's all sorts of things you can do with an engineering degree. In that role, I also worked on processes and strategy to bridge the gap between engineering and construction. And when my current job started up, I went to the field to learn more about the construction side of the business. Late last year, I became the project turnover manager, where I drive work processes and automation to ensure complete, quality, and timely handover of our systems to our commissioning group and to our end customer. I've been passionate about women's empowerment uh, from as early as I can remember. And actually, I think it's a big reason why I went into engineering, to, to break that status quo. I had a great opportunity to direct that passion with our business resource group for women, Women at Bechtel. I joined the board in Houston, and I worked my way up through the ranks to become the global chair of the group in 2018. With over a thousand members and 16 chapters, it wasn't a small gig. My time with Women at Bechtel was my first experience of leadership. I was able to hone that leadership skill set long before an official position. You learn how to turn strategy into tactical action. You learn how to manage your time. And you learn how to motivate people because volunteers do not work unless they are motivated. My second piece of advice is join a BRG or create a BRG or volunteer somewhere external to your work. It is demanding, but you create opportunities to hone your leadership that are invaluable. I handed over the Women at Bechtel leadership reins earlier this year, but I remain a fierce champion of diversity and inclusion in our company and in our industry. Yoga has always been a constant presence in my life. And actually, when I was out in Australia, I led uh, practices with my colleagues 
to help them unwind and de-stress. That actually started when one of the teams said that yoga was easy. He was proved wrong. As soon as I got back to Houston in 2016, I signed up for yoga teacher training and became a registered yoga teacher within the year. I found a real sweet spot where mindfulness, yoga, and meditation could really complement my career in STEM rather than counter it. I've been teaching yoga ever since, and I build on my experiences in yoga, in work, and in diversity and inclusion to lead yoga and leadership's, leadership retreats for women. So let's talk about leadership. In 2018, I got my first official leadership position, and I was determined to do it my way. Because of my work in diversity and inclusion, I was familiar with some models for inclusive leadership, and I also had some experience from my Women at Bechtel days. This was my chance to demonstrate a different and still great leadership archetype. Step one, I think, is to recognize your team for the imperfect humans that they are and have a little compassion for that. Compassion is not weakness, and in many cases, it takes a lot more bravery and strength to demonstrate compassion than it does coldness. Along with that, though, you do have to establish firm expectations on performance and delivery and hold your team accountable to that. Accountability is empowering. A simple and easy way to start building an inclusive and tight-knit team is to stimulate deeper connections between your people. I do this through inclusion moments, which are very simple get-to-know-you questions that I introduce at the start of all my team meetings. They can be anything from, are you a beach or mountain person? Are you a cat or dog person? Or what are you afraid of? It's really fun to actually rotate uh, the, pe the person who is asking the question between your team so you can get to know what other people are interested in learning from the group. It's especially important for remote teams because you miss a lot of that chit chat when you're not in the room together. In recruiting, I defined clear competencies for each role, I reviewed resumes against them, and I interviewed for them. It sounds simple, but it's really not. And it takes a hell of a lot more time than hiring the person you knew on the last job. I, re I relied more on who my team knew than who I did, and that diversity was exponential. It wasn't always easy, and there were people in construction who just didn't know what to do with me. Some people saw the inclusion moments as time wasters, and I wasn't respecting people's time. Others, like I said, saw my kindness for weakness. I knew I didn't fit into that leadership archetype, especially the construction version. I knew it was going to feel uncomfortable, but I didn't know it would feel like I was an organ being rejected. Construction sites are unfortunately still a very highly charged, macho, and male-dominated environment. From daily little reminders that I was an outsider to more serious unwanted attention, I had incremental nudges that I didn't belong. It was also extremely draining having to navigate the balance between adapting and working and succeeding in the current culture and speaking out against it. All this in a challenging new role in a new city with no support network and as a result a suffering relationship meant that my life was work, sleep, eat, and draining. I burnt out. Uh, my mental health crashed, and I went into what I now know is a high-functioning depression. So often people make themselves sick, tirelessly pursuing an ideal of leadership. They give everything that they've got, and they have nothing left. And I don't buy that men are more capable or resilient in this type of work. Mental health struggles are on the rise among men. White middle-aged men are the most likely to die of suicide, and more men in the construction industry take their lives than any other industry. So embracing new ways of working and new ways of leadership isn't just about attracting talent. It's about keeping our talent healthy, happy, and alive. Luckily, I had some wonderful people in my life to give me a wake-up call, and I slowly went through the work of making myself better. If you happen to be in that place now, know that you're not alone. And also know that the only person who is going to help you is you. Step by step, little by little. Make tiny, 
better choices around what you eat and drink, exercise a little more, look for people to speak to or resources to reach out to, whether it's your employee assistance program or one of the many free online resources for people struggling with mental health issues. Do things that bring you even a little bit of contentment and set yourself some clear boundaries on how and when you work and how and when you look after yourself. I could do a whole talk on just this, <laughs> and I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to reach out. But for now, know that it was one of the hardest things that I did, and I did it. And you can do it too. The other thing is that this is a real risk for many in the engineering and construction industry. It's high stress, high paced, and a lot of people suffer. So take care of yourself, take care of the people around you, and get to know yourself well enough that you can recognize when you need some more help. Today I'm reset, and recovery is a very long process. It was obviously a hugely difficult part of my life, but I learned a lot about what my values are, and I can take that into how I work, how I live, and how I lead. I'm doubled down on the type of leader that I want to be and the boundaries that I have between work and life. I also have hope. I'm meeting more and more women in engineering and construction who I can support and who I can lean on. I'm meeting more and more men who are championing inclusion and diversity and wellness. I'm seeing more and more training and programs and communication by companies on inclusion and on mental health. And I'm seeing the engineering and construction industry wake up to all of this stuff. Also, my leadership style is working. That team became incredibly close considering they were located all across a gigantic site. They shared best practices, they supported each other, and they were known for their results and their delivery. I also got glowing upward feedback, if I do say so myself, and I was recognized for role modeling work-life flexibility. There's work to go yet, I wanna be real, but I'm also really excited for the industry that we're creating, an industry where women and all types of people get to be the leader that they wanna be and deliver world-class jobs as a result without making themselves sick. I believe that we can do it our way and that we don't have to make ourselves sick to be successful. But there is balance between adapting and surviving in the current corporate infrastructure and gradually pushing the way for new changes, new leadership and new dynamics. Changing a decades old mold is uncomfortable and you have to be able to look after yourself. No one else is really gonna do that for you. You have to know what your boundaries are. You have to know how you wanna work and how you wanna live. And then you have to find a company that will celebrate you for that. There's work to go yet. I wanna be real, but I'm also really excited for a future where all different types of people can be all different types of leaders and deliver world-class jobs without making people sick. I'm also really excited about the role that women will play in building that future. Changing an old mold is uncomfortable. You need to be able to look after yourself, establish a good support network, and boundaries on how you work and how you recharge. And you need to be able to not take things too personally. Otherwise, it'll leave you feeling deflated and crushed, and no one's changing the world in that state. We can be ourselves in this industry and we can create our own leadership archetypes. Companies can choose to celebrate that or not. The companies who do will reap the rewards of a diverse and talented and plentiful labor market. My last piece of advice is this. Go where you are celebrated, not where you are tolerated. You have the power. I don't know about you, but after those amazing stories, I'm ready to break some rules. 
Now's our chance to chat with our speakers in real time. So be ready with your questions. Submit them through the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar. Take it away, ladies. For, your, for sharing your truly inspirational and very personal stories with us. Um, I know we talked about this earlier and uh, you've been, you're such in, inspirations and we won't spend long on this, but one of the burning questions I have, you can all see we're all working from home at the moment. Um, one piece of advice for, for handling the, the culture right now and the situation right now in terms of um, in terms of dealing with working at home just one of the things one of the, just one little thing that you're doing to keep yourself sane if you would if you wouldn't mind <laughs> Vanessa do you want to start sure yeah I think that uh, the biggest thing is continued communication with everyone I was reading something about social isolation not emotional isolation so making sure that you're still calling friends and family and making time to do things that bring you joy. Kind of a lot of Laura's advice at the end of her video about taking care of your mental health. Lauren? Uh, yeah, um, I think the quality of communication is key. So the inclusion moments that I talked about, we're doing those in all of our team meetings. We are kind of forcing some chit chat as well. Uh, video wherever possible. I know it can be awkward, uh, but it really does improve the what you take from it. And then the big one for me, I'm sure uh, Pavlina will touch on this too, is a little bit of time for exercise, a little bit of time just to move your body and stretch or something. So Pavli Pavlina? So for me, it's having a routine uh, that you follow. I don't know how many people have seen the photo that has been going around with the guy holding the bath, uh, bathroom pole. So maybe not doing that, but having a new routine <laughs> under these new circumstances. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I now turn to the questions and we've had a lot of questions coming through. So excuse me looking up to my screen here. The one, that, uh, one question, how can one get the public to, to, to not place um, people in a, in a box that are com that confined to the hard skills in engineering, especially when you'd like to explore art and the business side? Um, I, the, the, the questionnaire questioner says she feels like we miss the opportunities whenever we want to break the rules, that society isn't very welcoming. So how do we break these socially generated stereotypes that are against our progress? Which one would you like, to, which one of you would like to start? I, I, I can answer that. Uh, so I, I do, I, as I mentioned, I come from Cyprus and Cyprus is a very, very small island. So if you think about engineering, you pretty much think about the, I don't know, a plumper, a construction worker or somebody with a hard hat. Um, what I have seen very different happening in the UK, they are tr trying to challenge um, what engineering really is by developing these motivation videos, which I'm one of them as well, uh, and basically trying to show that engineering is more than just a hard hat. They've even developed a Flickr library now that uh, basically is pictures of engineers not wearing hard hats. Um, and, and I think it's just looking at opportunities to show, uh, even now with hashtags, that engineering is not uh, about a construction worker, um, you know, uh, with dirty boots and I don't know, a guy basically. It's, so it's, it's in our hands basically to show that it's different and to speak about it as well. Any, yeah, uh, Vanessa? yeah. I mean, I, I did a dual degree in engineering and business, so I definitely know that sensation where you're kind of skewing more business for a little while or doing something a bit more creative and you're feeling like, um, am I doing engineering? And, you know, maybe people even explicitly will say to you like, oh, you're, you know, you're not doing engineering or something like that. So I think that the best thing to do is to just 
follow where your passions and interests and skill sets lie because at the end of the day you if you just the definition and the box exists but that doesn't mean you have to go into it so you you just follow what makes most sense for you and you're still doing engineering and you still are an engineer because at the end of the day it all comes down to problem solving so mm -hmm if uh yeah so i it's something i definitely struggle with a lot too and i think the best thing to do is just, just keep going i think another another point just to add is that you don't have to do it all in your day job too if you have uh you know creative passions or you have any sort of passions you you can do things outside of your nine to five or six to six depending on where you work uh <laughs> so i you know I love teaching yoga. I love running these yoga and leadership retreats. I, you know, write, I send out a newsletter. Um, it's not necessarily breaking a box of what an engineer is, but it's very empowering for me to find where those intersections are. And, uh, and they, you know, the engineering piece helps, um, helps the yoga piece and the yoga piece helps the engineering piece. So you can reap a lot of benefit from that. Great. Thank you, thank you. So another question that's got, that's had a lot of votes, and I think it's addressed to Laura, but I think all, all three of you can possibly answer that. Laura, you talked about how important it is to speak up about what you want out of your career. What do you do when you feel like no one is listening? And how do you bring attention to your career goals? Laura, do you want uh, to go? Yeah, I guess there's two pieces to that. The first is, um, asking questions to make sure that your career goals are uh, like practical for where you're at, um, the company you're at, you know, uh, the position, uh, your, the position in your career that you're at. So it, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, but you can ask questions to get more targeted on where you can find more information. Um, questions are, you know, one of the most powerful pieces, things we have in our toolkit. So uh, don't just say this is what my goals are. You can ask people, you know, what your strengths are. Ask people where they see people like you um, succeeding in the company. And then the flip side to that is ask different people. If there's uh, certain individuals who aren't listening to you, um, go and find someone else to talk to. Uh, it, it can be hard. I mean, I've been really blessed with some great mentors uh, and people have connected me with individuals, but whether it's in your company or external mentoring programs, or even just on LinkedIn, you can get someone to introduce you uh, to, to someone and, and make a connection and ask them some questions uh, and broaden your network and broaden the people who you're talking to about career goals. I would say that, you know, it sounds like you're doing the right thing about commenting about what you want and being vocal is so important. I had a similar, situation where I was vocal about wanting to go to Vancouver and so Pepsi sent me to Vancouver um, but at the end of the day if you're doing what's within your power and you're not getting the feedback and support you need then maybe you have to look critically at if you're in the right job or right company that's going to support you. Um, I forget the exact wording but Laura's comment about going to where you're celebrated not just accepted or celebrated. Or not uh, not yes exactly <laughs> so um making you know that's that's so important when it comes to your career there is another thing that i would like to add in terms of listening is also um we are people with very different styles especially if you come from different countries you have different uh, approach to different things um so from my experience sometimes you might think you're making a point but the other person might not understand that you're making that point because it's the way you're phrasing things. Uh, for example, from my experience, uh, I mean, I'm very, very direct. Uh, my emails are usually what I need in the title, uh, but uh, it's quite common here to write a very big paragraph to try to say something and you don't really understand what they're trying to say ultimately. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so it's just being flexible in your style and understanding who is the other person. Um, can you change your style to be able to be heard? Um, so that's also because we're diff people, different styles, 
uh, maybe we have something at home that's bugging us so we don't want to listen because we're thinking of something else. So it's just being flexible and giving people time to listen or changing your style as well. Great, great advice. Great advice. I, I always used to told, told my kids and I'll tell young people to do what you're really good at and do what you're passionate about. And then that will rub off on, on, on where you want to go and what you want to do, I, I think. And so stay, I, I, lo I loved all, th all three of you saying, follow your passions, do what, you're, what you really interests you and what you're passionate about. So next question. And this is, a, this is one I think we'll all relate to. Any advice on the bro culture at work? Yeah. You know, the... <laughs> I've, I've been in kind of complete opposite spectrums of this. I've been in, you know, the current work environment I'm in, like the Spin Master product development team, we have a female VP, a female director, a largely female uh, group of engineers and a lot of openly queer people. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end has been in manufacturing facilities I've worked at on the manufacturing floor when there's one woman in three shifts and you know you know you make a comment about a sexist remark and someone's like sexism exists here and you're like mm, yeah <laughs> so it's i think the biggest thing to do is a to know that there are other workplaces and other industries out there that are not all like that so if that's something to keep in mind if you're really really struggling with it but to also just live your truth like being authentically who you are like again it's challenging when people aren't supporting you and that you're feeling different and it's it's wearing on you but if you try to change who you are to meet other people's needs a the culture is never going to change and b you're going to be miserable so if you can just you know my recommendation is to to do what you can to push through that and maybe find a balance of like laughing at one joke that you find just silly versus offensive and then when something really bad happens like finding ways to to manage it and who you can trust to talk to laura yeah so i mean i'm on a construction site um, with about 8,000 8, of my closest friends. Uh, not right now, obviously. Uh, it is, I'm not sure if it's, if it's the place as well, but it's one of the most um, bro, bro-ish, bro cultures that I've worked in. Um, and granted, it does vary uh, from country to country. Um, okay, a few things. The first is support network and being really proactive about a support network. Like you can't sit back and expect to make friends if um, the majority of people who are working around you are, you know, a little bit different from you. And by support network for me, I mean, um, you know, girlfriends, uh, <laughs> but that can vary for different people. Usually it's, usually it's helpful to have someone or some people who are in your affinity to uh, just really share your experiences. Um, the second is uh, try not to take things too personally. Everyone is on a is on a journey, a culture journey. Everyone's learning. Everyone's at different uh, phases. So with, if you have the you know empowerment of your support network, there are days where things will feel less serious. There are still days where they will feel more. Um, and then the third is start establishing those lines of connection to, to male allies or you know the dominant population allies um because they're out there it's it's and also for the most part bro culture is um you know it's like a conditioned social norm it's not really who the majority of those people are they just get spun up in it in that in that culture so talking to men and male champions one-on-one -on -one, um, using humor to, uh, you know, talk about why a certain comment might be uh, not as comfortable for you. And then you can slowly build up the people who are speaking for you so you don't have to. Pavlina, anything to add? I mean, uh, so um, I did face some comments in the past, but um, I mean, from my perspective, I usually I, I focus on the on what to do the best that I can. 
Um, I, uh, I remember I was working on a project recently and uh, it was a private apartment that had a dance pool. It was for a famous artist. And the contractor was like, oh, would you give us a spin? And I was like, well, how, you, how about if you do that? So I sort of joked back, uh, I don't take the comments seriously, that makes sense. And I just focus to do uh, the best of my work because ultimately that will speak about what I do rather than these comments that, um, um, so, so I don't take them very seriously personally. I, I sort of joke back at, at them, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could be my age, but I, 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 used, I used to do that. I used to shrug it off all the time, just ignore them. But we've had quite a few comments in the in the chat box saying, you know, sometimes the men don't actually realise that they are they've got a bro culture, and so if you push back occasionally, you can you you can get them to go, oh, did, did I really come across like that? That kind of thing. So there's been there's been some great comments in the in the um, in the chat box on this area on this area as well and I've certainly learned there are times when you just got to say no that's not appropriate mm -hmm. but up and, up and other times you using um, using humor and go and and giving them the well-armed stare um, or the well-placed stare uh, sometimes works but certainly calling to attention to it is something I've changed now over the time over my my career anyway um, next question: um, How do we how do we break the rules or change the status quo that that women can be great engineers and leaders? Actually, before you, you go on to that, I, I is just reminded we we have scheduled um, for an hour for an hour and a half this session. I know some of you may have to drop off on the call, but if you want to stay on, we've still got a lot of questions. But and so um, so I'm just giving you the it's the five past one mark but we're, we're planning to stay on for another couple, another 20 minutes or so answering questions. Anyway, so I'll read that question again. How do we break the rules or change the status quo that women can be great engineers and great leaders? Pavlina, do you want to start with that one this time? By leading by example. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that's it, right? It's uh, basically, uh, it's, by, it's by seeing that you understand that it's possible. Um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like um, breaking male versus female. I, I don't usually like to compare. Uh, when I try to do my best, I don't you say the best for women. I always say the best that I can do personally. So I, I, I don't like so much dividing male versus female, if that makes sense. So I try to do the best. Uh, I'm quite competitive, so if I don't do very well, I try harder. <laughs> so, um, so that's uh, is, that's the way that I try to lead by example. And actually, my role model is a male role model. Um, I don't really think of him as male. I just see how he responds to things, and I try to reflect the, his way of working as well, if that makes sense. Um, so that's that's my answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree entirely that um, we need more and constant representation of strong female engineering leaders um, and, and just people of various minorities and intersections. So by you doing what you can to get there, like you're helping someone else see that you exist. So I, I definitely feel that just finding opportunities, whether it's, you know, explicitly in the workplace or, for example, me doing something like this, like I decided yesterday to email half my company that I was doing this. And even though it's technically like, you know, more through end queers and stuff, but I am still representing Spin Master. So be finding kind of unique ways to, to express your leadership, I think is a, a really important idea as you're working to get to a, a full leadership title. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I agree. You know, to the previous comments for sure. Delivery, delivery, delivery. You know, you need, you you need that to be able to rest. You know, to you, you need that foundation to spring from, right? Um, I would say, be yourself. Uh, you know, work. Do some work around what your strengths are, what your leadership style is, what styles resonate for you. Because we don't, we can start breaking the rules when we start seeing different types of leader or different, 
you know, different activities that leaders do. And one style of leadership is not the right one or, or the only one, right? So figure out what your style is. Actually, someone on my team suggests um, just, you know, creating some three to five words on, you know, what you what do you want people to think about when they talk about your leadership style and then go and educate yourself on those words and train yourself around those well. But, e but even that leadership style needs to be very flexible because one leadership style works with one person but it doesn't necessarily work with another person um, oh, yeah. so it just needs to be flex uh, you know they're all we are all human beings and we have our personal issues uh, our, our way of uh, behaving so you know on the other side is the same thing as well they have their problems they have their way of behaving so mm -hmm. as leaders you need to be flexible to uh, you know, you cannot be like uh, uh, aggressive or something like that, <laughs> you know? So yeah, so, yeah, I totally um, agree. Situational I think, leadership. Yeah. yeah. I think one other thing, though, is to um, be educated to the realities of your workplace, right? Um, you can be a great leader, you can be delivering, but there are still biases that are going to come up against you. Uh, and they can be that can be really confusing if you don't understand what they are. Things like the Lean In Foundation does a really good job on educating against uh, educating around some key uh, biases that face particularly women in the workplace, like prove it again bias um, is is one that's springing to mind right right away. So you sh you have to deliver, you have to define what sort of leader you want to be, you have to be flexible, but also be educated on what the very real barriers are in your industry or in your workforce so that you can empower yourself against those. So that's a really good segue actually into the next question that we have here. So what is your advice for a person who started work, work in a totally different industry but is willing to learn and improve and grow on a, continu on a continuous basis but at the same time is working with people who've been in the industry for 10, 20, 30, 40 years which many of us have for most of the time and you don't actually get you have not you've not got that support from these experienced people how do you deal with with that how do you deal with 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 all the experience which which you may not have getting into an industry or being in the industry where you where you're quite new in this area but you don't and you can't really lean on someone with the with the um, with many 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 years experience I think I would say know your strengths like there are so many transferable skills in between different industries, whether it's from a hard engineering skill set standpoint or a soft skill standpoint. And you're going to have to be flexible about asking questions and uh, making sure you're keeping an open mind to learn from others. But know that there's a reason you got hired and that you're in this new role. And it's not that, you know, your employee employer saw something in you and that you should also see something in yourself that there's a you know you're going to be able to adapt and grow and and sometimes it's a fresh perspective is really helpful so don't underestimate that like the people who've been seeing the same thing for so long they might be uh they might have a just completely different point of view than you so that that'll be very useful to them yeah i agree i i challenge that you don't necessarily you can't learn from people who have been in an industry for 20 30 years like it, it it's about attitude right you have to go in with a a learning attitude and a questioning attitude and not try and like i don't know throw, throw your weight around and say you're the boss or anything yeah. um but i've had great mentors who are you know 30 years my senior um giving me advice about the industry um yeah, so you're not necessarily in a hard spot there. So for, from my perspective, changing industry, I mean, who has used what they've learned in their master's degree in their actual workspace? I mean, it's very different what you learn at university and it's very different what you actually learn at work. So it's exactly the same. If you change an industry, it's the same situation, right? You learn by doing. Um, so, and then in terms of the age gap, I mean, a, a, for me, my role model that is a male role, role model actually is because he was a person who uh, I worked on a project and let, he let me voice my opinions and he let me deliver things 
in my own way. And that's when you have a strong mentor, it's somebody who lets you um, develop your own methods of working and he's there to guide you and direct you uh, towards the right solution. Um, I mean, especially now with all this new technology, I mean, I am so far behind and I'm only 35. Um, so I uh, so what I like to do is let the younger people develop the new, the new systems as long as the answer um, is uh, the right one, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually quite challenging uh, if you, for, um, to have leaders like that that actually let the younger people show their own strengths. Uh, but uh, it's quite, uh, and you're quite lucky actually if you have a leader like that who does let you do your own things. Um, yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> Great. Well, thank, thank you. And, and, and um, we, we have the next question, and it, and it ties in, I think, with a, a little question further down as well. Part of breaking the rules is to have the confidence to do it. How, how do you build your confidence, especially when you're feeling put down or belittled? And I know um, another question a little bit further down, and maybe part of the answer is, is a mentor. One of the questions is, where do you find good mentors? Where have you found good mentors? So confidence, how are you, how have you, how do you build yeah. your confidence? Um, I think confidence just comes from, I think we've kind of mentioned this a lot, but knowing your strengths and just being able to, you know, we're all good at something. So knowing what that is and being confident in those areas and then being open to learning in others. Because I think that, you know, I've gotten feedback that I come across as very confident and I am very confident, but there are definitely days where I feel imposter syndrome, like I don't belong or I'm not smart enough. And, uh, you know, I, I'll dig into really small comments like tenfold over and make them a big deal sometimes. So, you know, but still portraying outwardly as comfortably as you can and then having conversations behind closed doors is like a really good tactic to kind of keep up that, um, you know, professionalism whenever you can. And then regarding mentors, I've had incredible mentors in my career. And I find that a lot of the male mentors I've had have uh, been much my senior, <laughs> um, many decades older than me with a lot of experience. And um, I think I find I bond very well with people who are extremely opposite to me. So either very introverted people or um, I've even had some of the like bro type guys end up being my mentors because I'll feel more comfortable challenging them. And then they're like, ooh, what's that about? And then we become close. So finding those people in that regard. And then I've, I've just found people in uh, kind of unique ways. Like in first year, I went to some first year like council uh what are they called a uh, focus group and the woman who was running it has ended up being my mentor for years so it's just like you never know where they're gonna come they're usually pretty organic but just lean in on relationships that are developing and 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 keep them going yeah, on the mentor piece, um, the majority of people out there who you see and admire and, and are interested to talk to you, uh, interested to talk to, will be willing to talk to you, mm -hmm. especially if you have some degree of connection, like a person in common or a seminar or an, or an event. Um, and just, you can reach out with an email and ask for 15, 20 minutes of time to hear about their career journey and ask them some questions. And then if you click, you can say, can we talk again in a couple weeks time? If you don't, then, then that's fine. And you, can, and you can do it again some other time. So occasionally my mentors have been people that I've reached out to and just said, can we have a you know, 20 minute catch up? I'm interested in, in learning some more about you. And others have been, uh, you know, people who have maybe identified me in the company, you know, I've been visible for one reason or another and wanted to put me in touch with someone to speak to. So I would say, yeah, lean on your, lean on your network and, and don't be afraid to reach out. The confidence piece is so difficult because it's, it's a lot more internal, a lot more personality based. There's a meditation exercise that I've done that is essentially thinking through a time where you felt really confident 
and almost embodying that time, even, you know, the outfit you were wearing or the people you were with or the music or the smells or the sounds or wherever and embodying that moment in a short meditation and then almost putting a name to that character mm. and being Sasha able Fierce. to say, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Sasha Fierce is coming out. Um, but the meditation kind of helps ground the feeling of confidence in your body. I love that Beyonce vibes. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, confidence, um, to tell you the truth, I, I don't think I'm generally very confident. Uh, I might sound confident because I'm very loud. So people think I'm confident. <laughs> uh, but it, I think it's also good not to be fully confident because it helps you build a strong basis. And, uh, you know, you need to research things uh, in order to be sure that you know what you're talking about. Um, and confidence also comes with experience. But even, I mean, I've been in the industry now for uh, 12 years, but I'm still not fully confident. Uh, I still have this nervousness that something will go wrong or something, you know, uh, horrible will happen. But I think that's healthy as well because it makes you not cocky, uh, not a show off. Uh, and, you, and it makes you really uh, research things and uh, test things uh, extra hard rather than just take them for granted. Um, in terms of mentors, I mean, my, my mentor came through working with him uh, because I like his style and I try to use the same style uh, with the people that I work with. So I have a couple of mentees now just because they like my style. <laughs> so I think it just uh, is a connection. It's liking what you see and trying to be similar, I guess. That's uh, how you get your mentor and how you become a mentor as well. Great, thank you. Those are all those are great advice, and we've also had some great uh, comments in the chat window as well of people sharing their experiences in that area. So here's a here's a really interesting question. Um, um, uh, I'll read it. What is the best or most memorable career advice you have received from father figures in your life? As an ag engineer I, uh, and father of two young kids, one being a four-year-old daughter and a father figure for an 11-year-old nephew, I think, about, I think a lot about what good bits of career advice I can provide at various times in their lives. So what's the most memorable or um, or best piece of career advice you've you, you've uh, received. You're thinking Good one. about that. <laughs> Go on, Laura. No, I was saying it's a good one. Nothing. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking through. I think the biggest thing I would say is, uh, as I kind of alluded to, I didn't really have a strong father figure, but um, just from general male presence he's in my life um i like what i would recommend to a father is that your daughters are going to be exposed to a lot of society telling them that they shouldn't do things or they're not capable of things or math is for boys or they're not smart enough like they're going to hear a lot of these messages so making sure that you're staying on them to kind of squash those especially i think it's grades four to six is the biggest time that those things can really sink in mm -hmm. um, and making sure that uh, if you want to encourage them on like a STEM kind of path that you're keeping note of their like prerequisites like if they're not doing the right maths and sciences in high school then that's going to really limit them later um, but just in general I would say like encouraging them to like there's, I see a lot of videos online of fathers like saying these great things to their daughters and, and being very motivating about, you know, you can do anything, like giving them, maybe there's, you know, a male marketed toy or something that is like a, a great STEM toy, but maybe just, you know, bring that and be excited about it with your kid or, or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those types of things. I think, I think it's just about being constantly communicating with them about what's kind of going on in their lives and uh, making sure that they're in the right headspace. Adelina, go on. So, so my dad always says, everything you see around you is made by engineers. Uh, so, and, he, and he keeps saying that, you know, um, 
Um, so, uh, so if it's if it's a if I mean my career was sort of set out to tell you the truth because I did have a dad who sort of encouraged me and pushed me towards an engineering career. Um, but that's why I'm very passionate about teaching in STEM. I, I teach uh, children as well to show them that engineering is not all these hardcore things. You can do a lot of design and artsy things as well, which is what I do. Um, it's science and art, basically. Uh, so if you did want to encourage them to do STEM, uh, I will look at what they're interested in, and I bet there is some sort of engineering in it. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so that's uh, that's my piece of advice. Yeah, that's kind of inspired a thought process here. <laughs> Thanks, Lena. <Lavina>. Um, <laughs>